Okay, we're back live in Orlando for SAP Sapphire. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. This is a special um, segment on services. Obviously, SiliconAngle.com has a section, and now a year old as of this trip, where we're called ServicesAngle.com, and we cover all the angles in the exploding services business, which is kind of a boring business, but it's become, in the past year, very of a hot focus area relative to cloud, mobile, and social in memory, and it's the focus of this segment. I'm joined with Jeff Kelly and Shri from Capgemini. Um, guys, welcome to this, this conversation. Thank you. So, uh, Capgemini, obviously, you guys make a lot of money from working with SAP. Mm -hmm. um, it's no secret. These consulting firms roll out a lot of SAP. Yep. Going back to the glory days when, you know, the dollars were much bigger. Um, and they are, are still big, but it's changing. So, we are hearing from SAP. And they're not saying it, but we'll, we'll cannibalize our old business to build the new. You're seeing cloud with off-premise with cloud, and they're saying we're going to keep you on-premise in the core and move some of the core in the cloud. Um, sounds good on paper. Mm -hmm. So you got to execute on that. So right. tell us your perspective on the issues around moving to the cloud, and then we can go into some of the conversations specifically about things you're working on. Sure, I think the, uh, the single most important fulcrum here is the customer's needs, right? And the customer's needs when they change from the traditional CapEx-based buying to OpEx-based buying, that shifts the needle in terms of how the ecosystem, whether it be software, hardware, services companies respond. Mm -hmm. And in that context, Capgemini is no different, right? We have traditionally been working with uh, SAP in very different segments, uh, broad-based system integration projects. At the same time, we have invested very heavily in the cutting edge uh, big data, HANA, and mobility areas as well. So we are essentially reacting to the customer's demand in terms of that shift of buying patterns in adopting cloud and virtual technologies as the need will move ahead. I'm interested, so how, how, does, how do your clients view SAP from that angle from when it comes to cloud and big data? I mean, they're SAP often associated with, they, they have a long and rich history, uh, but you know, this not necessarily known as the, uh, the most cutting edge of companies these days, starting mm -hmm. to change that image. But just curious, what do you see in terms of perception? When people think cloud, do they think SAP now? Do they, hear, when you hear big data, do your clients think SAP? I think it has come a far away in the last two, three years. I think ever since the, uh, I think a couple of years ago when um, SAP jointly announced the initiative with uh, EMC, VMware, and VCE, Intel, uh, that kind of set a stage in SAP's ambition to embrace the cloud and big data much more uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how things are being perceived by the companies. And in that regard, uh, it has come in last two, three years, so it's come a long way, uh, particularly with uh, uh, technologies like VMware helping uh, SAP move the needle on the database front as mm -hmm. well as on the cloud enablement and infrastructure readiness front. And uh, that also is powered by some of the leading technologies from EMC and VCE, which lends credibility to that fact. Mm -hmm. So talk about the, uh, the channel opportunities around partners, because obviously SAP, huge partner message, EMC, we talk to this stuff all the time in the VX, uh, VF Cash launch. It's all about kind of prefabricating the packaging and make it uh, easy to sell into the channel. We covered that with the Cube. Um, but we are now in this new era of channel partners or providers yep. partners where you know, there's a lot of services to wrap around these solutions. And there, there's, a, there's been a trend towards hardening the solutions mm -hmm. like with VBlock and with VCE. You know, it's complicated, but then they package it. Now you can just turn key and you wrap services around it. Yep. So it's kind of the old SAP model. And, you know, ERP and CRM were you know, huge deployment with a, with a business objective in mind. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what are the key business objectives that you're seeing right now that's uh, a forefront on the customers' minds um, and the, that the partners are servicing? Is it a pain point? Is it specifically a use case? Um, where are you seeing the traction relative to these new solutions that are, um, have a lot of services wrapped around them? I think the, the unified compute architecture, or the integrated architecture as people call that space, I think it is it's really emerging, and it is, it's an automatic use case for greenfield opportunities, so there is no easy, easy answer, or rather difficult answer there. It, the difficulty lies in when existing large enterprises want to adopt the benefits of a fully virtualized environment, clubbed with these heavy workloads which are running on some machines which are uh, order of the day. I think the real challenge, as I see it, is certain industries like retail and financial services and uh, even a large uh, uh, state government like state of Texas uh, mm -hmm. very recently announced uh, adopting these as the unified architecture as they want to move to. Mm -hmm. And as you probably may be aware, Capgemini is the leading 
uh, services integrator and management operator there. Mm -hmm. And that puts us in a unique position to control the various providers and their outputs to that unified architecture. And that, that's you, one, yes. Can one. you talk about some of the projects you're working on to give the folks out there a feel for some of those Cap Gemini um, opportunities that you're pursuing and give a taste of like what's it like out there? What are the kinds of projects? Just some examples, if you can. Yeah, I think the, the biggest uptake that we're seeing is in the retail sector, of course, and that's a strong suit for us. We are taking uh, increased penetration in the oil and gas uh, areas as well in terms of actually winning projects in the old model, mm -hmm. uh, but clubbed with uh, offering them a whole suit of license, build, host, operate, and run, the whole, whole nine yards. So the value proposition, while earlier it was just on the system integration side of the business, mm -hmm. now it is encompassing the IT as a service model, which covers the whole gamut of operations. Right. So I uh, wonder, can we dig in a little bit in the details of, uh, from a services perspective? So what does it take? What are some of the key things when you're you know, going to a large enterprise, got a legacy infrastructure, maybe some outdated technology, and you do want to make, they do want to invest in kind of a, in a unified infrastructure. What are some of the key uh, issues, challenges in that, in that uh, opportunity there? I think the, the biggest thing is it's a journey. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like any, the real value is to establish immediate return on investment on specific pockets, which is part of a larger milestone to get to the end goal. Mm -hmm. So the companies which have invested smartly in figuring out that roadmap as to how can I be fully utilizing the benefits of that unified compute architectures are investing in figuring out that journey elements. Mm -hmm. What are those milestones and picking the right bets which demonstrate immediate ROIs so that mm -hmm. you are benefiting from the OPEX play and adding on to the uh, current market scenarios around grow at the not compromising on the cost, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. that are the dynamics at least we are seeing playing it out in our customers. Yes. So it is in a way it's kind of a short term wins to kind of build momentum yes. uh, as, you, as you're moving forward, which is we see in a lot of technology areas, not just around infrastructure. Yeah. But I think like any around. other disruptive technology, the shift from client server technology eras to the new world will take its own time and mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think it's really managing the pace at which it can be done and also de-risking the whole process from a compliance and all of those perspectives, which is a key element here. Have you seen a change in the developer community? This came up in the, you know, the, the Q&A of the, the CEOs uh, around the developers. One of the things they said was, we want to get a million more developers to program the environment. Obviously, when these enterprises are rolling out these big infrastructures, they need more developers. You guys do a lot of the work in these high-end projects. You mentioned unified fabrics, unified instrumentation. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. So, okay, as it gets harder, are you seeing a new landscape of developers that you're hiring and working with? Yeah, I think the, the software as a service industry is really throwing open a whole new development community, like the Spring Source and Ruby on Rails are becoming the de facto Java development community for the new enterprise applications. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the traditional players getting challenged by companies like Salesforce.com, and that throws up a whole new uh, order and magnitude of uh, providing solutions. But I think at the same time, companies like SAP are embracing the whole process of how to make it more new age friendly in terms of programming languages and mm -hmm. capabilities. And that's very amply demonstrated in the new products that SAP is rolling out. What are you hearing in the hallway conversations here at SAP? From your perspective and, and your, your view from Capgemini, what are some of the hallway conversations that you could share with the folks out there? What are people buzzing about? What's top of mind here at this year's SAP conference? I think the, the biggest uh, data is the connection between uh, how big data is meeting the cloud. It seems like an EMC tagline, but I think it's the uh, the SAP has really embraced it to the degree of a productization. And it, what it really does, it, it amplifies it in terms of the HANA initiatives, the mobility initiatives, and of course, uh, how does the whole architecture work on a cloud? I think those are the fundamental touch points of SAP. Cool. All right, cool. Um, services in general, are you bullish on the services industry right now? You think you're it's in a transition, you think it's going to be higher growth? Uh, so you're in, the, you're in the trenches and you guys are on, on the high end of, of your, your spectrum relative to providers. How do you see the, the ecosystem developing in the services landscape? Uh, I think from a uh, growth perspective, we just came out with the results last week. So, uh, so it's, it's pretty uh, public information. I think we're growing reasonably well. Uh, I think from a industry perspective, the Gartner predicts a reasonable single-digit growth, uh, and in specifically the moment between the traditional IT towers and the new generation IT towers 
is mixed. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the adoption of the new generation towers is the penetration is increasing. And that really opens up a whole new opportunity for the community out there, the new IT professionals to embrace those technologies and be a part of the journey. So lastly, I talk about developers. Talk about the C-level, CIOs out there. I mean, are their mindsets changing? And what are you seeing in the mind of the CIO today? Um, and challenges and opportunities that they've been wrestling with. What are their, what's on their plate in the top three points? Uh, I think that the biggest thing that I've encountered mostly is around growth. And in the challenge, recession-prone environment that we're just coming off in the Americas, and Europe seem to be dabbling up and down on that front, and the only growth pocket is in Asia-Pacific. So I think the, the real challenges from a CIO perspective is to how to monetize and capitalize the growth opportunities in the growing economies, the BRICS, if you can call so, and marry it with a cost model which can be consumed there, which uh, they probably are at different price points than the traditional Western economies are operating on. So globalization so is a big issue, right? That's a big issue, and that at the same time, the strategies to go the growth, how do you tap into the growth and opportunity there? without losing your core, core foundational uh, business values. Is there a difference on that thread? This is, in, is there a difference, obviously, internationally, there is, but I mean, what are you seeing relative to the differences in these new emerging areas? Because in some of these developing countries, it's particularly mo the mobile economy, is that? It's not PC-based. So, different issues. you got carry, you got steering arrangements. Um, any insight you can share there on what you're seeing I think around mobile? Like our company probably as we ourselves are invested in heavily into countries like Brazil, for instance, and India and China, of course. I think the, the single biggest thing that we see are the uh, best practices, what has worked well in the Western economies are not the ones that will work there. So cracking the code within which is in-country, which is price point suited for that country, culturally mm -hmm. uh, appropriate for succeeding in that country, and the arrangements that you make in those countries become the order of the day. Mm. I think those becomes the key tend to watch out in terms of as the growth happens in Asia Pacific more and more and even Africa mm -hmm. for that matter. So that's the journey you have to kind of uh, find those, fine tune that strategy and kind of hit the sweet, sweet spot yes. uh, to, to really establish growth there. Yeah, the growth uh, obviously will happen in those economies while the, uh, come or the sort of consolidation and journey to this virtualization uh, will happen in the Western economies. So given that we heard a history lesson from Nave around technology growth, um, final comment for you, if you can share with the audience, your view of the future, um, shooting the arrow forward the next couple of years, also with all this kind of foundation in place, which we all are kind of drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, we love cloud mobile, social, and kind of memory, new architectures, um, what can you share with the folks to, uh, around the future? Uh, I think that the single biggest uh, prediction, if I may call it, I think is the uh, embracement of these unified architectures and the virtualized benefits that adds directly to the cost. The other direction that I see is the IT as a service journey is here to stay. So pay per use uh, it will, is here to stay. It's been exhibited in some pockets. I think the real impact is when the large enterprises fully understand and embrace the consequences of getting there and find a recipe to get there which where they can drive the benefits on that. Shreve from Capgemini, thank you very much. We are in Orlando for the Cube. We're broadcasting all day, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Eight hours today, eight hours tomorrow. We're covering the keynotes. We've got commentary, analysis, and thought leaders and guests. Um, and we're excited to be here, siliconangle.com and wikibon.org, to bring you this independent coverage of the event. And it would not be possible without the support of SAP and EMC. So we want to really thank SAP and EMC for providing the underwriting support throughout the year now two years of supporting the Cube. We want to thank them for that. So if you can just uh, virtually tip your hat to SAP and EMC, we'd really appreciate it. Again, they, they power this independent uh, content that we can bring to you. So we'll be right back with our next guest here in Orlando at SAP Sapphire 12 right after this break.